Lake Geneva, Switzerland. Home to the world's super rich and their secret bank accounts. Home to UEFA, football's governing body. And home to CAS, the court of arbitration for sport, who in 2020 made what some believe is one of the most controversial decisions in modern day football. It was here that Manchester City's two-year ban from European football was sensationally overturned. I don't think it was a good day for football. This is a scandal. This is one of the, the biggest scandals. It's a disgraceful decision. Led by one of the greatest managers of all time, Pep Guardiola, and owned by one of the richest men in the world, the UAE's Sheikh Mansour, Manchester City have just won the treble. Winning the European Champions League, the FA Cup and their sixth Premier League title was, according to Guardiola, written in the stars. But City have been brought back to earth. They're facing an unprecedented 115 charges from the Premier League for allegedly reporting their finances inaccurately over a nine-year period. Something City, its owners, and the club sponsors strenuously deny. In this film, we reveal secret documents and emails which the club and their golf owners didn't want the world to see. 27 million pounds to be funded via Etihad. The rest to be funded by alternative sources. We investigate whether City knowingly disguised income as sponsorship payments, and obstructed UEFA's investigations, and we exclusively reveal UEFA's damning verdict. The club accounting was designed to conceal the source of the funding. Compelling evidence that arrangements were made to disguise the true source of equity funding. Football insiders speak out for the first time. For us, it was clear that Manchester City was cheating with its commercial income and was deflecting from the losses. The system is essentially a charade, where it looks like there's regulation. There may be at the beginning a tough sanction when the investigators have done a great job. Then it moves to a high level. And because of some technicality, the tough sanction evaporates. There's a fear that if you do speak out and rock the boat, you will be thrown overboard. The situation that we have today, which is that the rules are effectively finished. What this shows is a game that's in thrall to money, a game that really cannot police itself. UEFA and CAS maintain the current regulatory framework is fit for purpose. The strength and quality of City's players and coach is beyond doubt, but have its owners' ambitions to create the best team in the world been achieved honestly and within the rules? The club's battle with the Premier League could see them stripped of their titles and expelled. Is this a fight City can win, or will it change football forever? June 2020, a global lockdown. In this strange world where everyday life had come to a standstill, Manchester City and its legal team were in Switzerland, fighting for the club's very survival. Seeking to overturn an unprecedented two-year ban from European football and a 30 million euro fine. How on earth had this football sporting giant ended up facing professional ruin? Manchester City were for decades in the shadow of their powerhouse neighbour, Manchester United. In 40 years, they never won a major trophy. But their fortunes changed dramatically in 2008, thanks to one man and his fabulous wealth. It was inevitable that the money would lead to success. Sheikh Mansour threw billions of pounds at Manchester City transforming them from mediocre also-rans into one of the best, most successful teams in global football. Money is not important for a club like City. You just open the oil taps. It's stunning, particularly if you're a Man City fan, is this for real, that one of the richest 
countries in the world, it's about to turn us into a powerhouse. Sheikh Mansour is the Vice President and Deputy Prime Minister of the United Arab Emirates and a member of the ruling family of Abu Dhabi. Football may not be his driving passion, he's only been to two competitive city matches in person, but he's everything you'd expect a billionaire sheikh to be. This is Topaz, his $450 million super yacht. His supercar collection is also worth a fortune. Mansour's invested heavily in international football. But City, bought for £210 million and today valued at around £3 billion, is the biggest and most valuable. The current Manchester City squad is worth about 1.067 billion euros, which is the most expensively assembled squad in the history of global football. There's been a lot of talk about the motivation of why Sheikh Mansour as an individual would buy Manchester City. And the narrative from, from, from the club's point of view and from his spin doctor's point of view has always been this is a personal love of football that drove Sheikh Mansour to buy Manchester City Football Club. I don't buy into that. The key people buying the club are the key lieutenants of Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan. These are the lieutenants of the ruler of Abu Dhabi in the UAE. There's Khaldun Al Mubarak, who, who serves a function at governmental level on policy, foreign policy, war policy, policy of, of the economics of the Emirate. That, for me, is one of the most serious signs of intent, most serious and most direct link to the UAE state. He is a formidable figure in that country. He runs the state investment fund, Mubadala, one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds. Another key figure is an Australian PR man. Simon Pearce has served as a communications um, director to the Abu Dhabi Executive Affairs Authority, essentially the, the propaganda arm of the Abu Dhabi state. Whenever there is a communications problem, Pierce is the guy charged with burnishing its reputation through ventures like Manchester City. This previously unseen presentation document demonstrates how many outside the UAE see City's value. The club is described as an invaluable resource whose impact comes from public relations, development, growth, and influence. Two, three. But football has rules about spending. Nation states and oligarchs are not allowed to buy their way to success. Obviously they spent a lot of money, but they spent a lot of money on, on quality players. The regulations established by UEFA, European football's governing body, are called FFP, Financial Fair Play. They came into force in 2011. Alex Phillips, formerly UEFA's Head of Governance and Compliance, played a key role in drawing up the FFP rules. The key part of it was the break-even rule, so that clubs could not spend more than they earn. The concept was meant to ensure that people couldn't come in and simply buy success. What it limited was the ability of owners of teams to inject cash from outside of the business, so money that the teams did not generate from their day-to-day -day activities, so broadcasting, hosting matches, and selling product, the three revenue streams. But there are concerns that owners with deep pockets can still ignore UEFA's FFP rules, according to this former senior UEFA official, who, fearful of reprisals, wishes to remain anonymous. Clubs with bottomless pockets will find a way to overspend and get sponsorships and other sources of revenue that appear legitimate to a big football club, but are not genuine sources of revenue. Manchester City benefited from extremely high sponsorship deals from entities based in Abu Dhabi, including, but not only, Etihad Airways, Etisalat and other entities, which you can't 
really believe would be paying those sums if they were genuinely arm's length deals. City and its sponsors have always denied this. Then in 2014, three years after FFP had been introduced, UEFA launched an investigation into allegations of wrongdoing by City. We've had sight of City's official three-year, multi-million pound sponsorship contract with Etihad, which covered the three seasons from 2009 to 2012. But it seems Etihad's accounts department saw some very different figures. This program has exclusively seen documents which appear to contradict the amount set out in the club's sponsorship contract with the airline. In particular, the documents suggest a junior in the Etihad Airline Accounts Department received a statement from City in April 2011 that indicated Etihad owed the club a total of 12 million pounds for the 2010-11 shirt sponsorship deal with eight million pounds still outstanding. There are people within Etihad who were certainly questioning the amount of sponsorship deals that they would have to be responsible for. After requesting the figures from Andrew Widowson, Manchester City's then head of finance, the accounts junior forwarded it to one of her managers in an attempt to clarify things. The document from City seemed to contemplate a total payment to the club of 12 million pounds for that year. Etihad had already paid four. Why did the statement suggest there was an outstanding balance of eight million pounds? Her Etihad colleague then referred the query up to a senior member of the airline sports sponsorship team. Attached is the statement of account with eight million pounds. And what we have paid is four million. The email suggests the Etihad executive then contacted a senior member of City's Partnerships Department to explain the disparity. As you are aware, Etihad's commitment is for four million pounds and the remaining balance, eight million pounds, is handled separately by the Executive Affairs Authority. The Executive Affairs Authority is a government agency reporting directly to the head of state. At the start of this email trail is the statement for 12 million pounds that had apparently been sent to the junior in Etihad's accounts department. But what she didn't see, but we have seen, is this invoice, which shows a line through the 12 million figure, and then beneath it in a handwritten note, the suggestion that Etihad were never going to pay more than four. When we asked Etihad, the Executive Affairs Authority, and the club about the apparent confusion, they gave no response. City were investigated by UEFA in 2014 for breaching FFP rules and were found guilty of overspending. City denied any wrongdoing, but accepted a conditional fine. They had this 60 million fine, which was later commuted to 20. I, I'm trying to recall other fines in the history of football when a, a single club has been fined more than 20 million euros, and there aren't many. In November 2018, German magazine Der Spiegel published The Football Leaks, one of the largest data leaks ever. Among the millions of documents that apparently detailed fraudulent deals between the world's top clubs, officials, agents and players, were internal emails from City, which appeared to show the club had once again broken FFP rules. They have to spend. They spend why? Because we need good players. Budapest, January 2019. Hungarian police, armed with an international arrest warrant, are hunting a Portuguese hacker, Rui Pinto, the man behind the football leaks. Football leaks, perhaps one of the most significant things that's happened in, in, in modern football, because it, it shines a light on an industry that doesn't want a light shone on it. I did this for the public, I did this for, 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 for all the football fans. 
his motivations for why he did that, if you ask him, it was to try to clean up this game that he loved so dearly, big fan of FC Porto. And his view was, this is disgusting. I want to do something about this. The Portuguese authorities claimed Pinto had also hacked government computers and wanted him behind bars. His trial continues. Former Portuguese presidential candidate and MEP Ana Gomes visited him in jail. He just wanted to find out whether there had been match fixing in the in the matches played by his club Porto with other clubs in Portugal. And he probably used his hacking skills to find out a lot of stuff, much more than he ever expected. Obviously, he, um, he was hacking, and this makes it difficult to look at him uh, as, as a hero. I don't buy the story that he's a fan of the game, and he wants to, uh, to show to the world and to the, well, help the fans to understand what's going on behind the curtains. I don't buy this story. But this former senior UEFA executive, disguised to protect his identity, believes Pinto's actions were justified. At the end of the day, it's not that important what his motivations were to people who want to know what has happened in these cases and how the system works. What's more important is the fact that if he hadn't exposed that information, then certainly people wouldn't know about some of the wrongdoing in football. Among the Football League's papers were six internal emails purportedly sent between some of City's top board-level directors. Four months after the Football Leaks were published, Der Spiegel posted all six on their website. That same day, UEFA downloaded them. To anyone who'd seen the emails, it was clear. It was a huge impact. Now there were uh, mails uh, in which these guys exchanged information and in which uh, they discussed uh, the way they did their business. What the emails purported to show, including with documentary evidence, is that there was disguised funding going into these sponsorship deals, that Etihad particularly, the Etihad deal in particular, was being majority funded by entities outside of Etihad. UEFA claimed City had disguised cash injections of at least £204 million from state funds, pretending instead it had come from the club's sponsors. This broke FFP rules. UEFA actioned its financial fair play investigators to look into this. Some of them are experts in their field, serious high caliber people. UEFA's financial fair play investigators are the IC, its investigatory chamber. This seven-strong team included distinguished lawyers, accountants, and academics. It was chaired by a former Belgian prime minister, Yves Leterme. UEFA's investigatory chamber spent six months painstakingly examining the six emails and cross-examining City's management team to try to uncover the truth about the sponsorship money trail. City, in effect, did everything they could to stymie and block the investigation. They refused to hand over documents, they refused to make witnesses available, they did everything they could to obfuscate and obscure the investigation for a long, long period of time. Creating fog is the best way of describing Man City's response. City argued the Football League's emails weren't admissible because they were criminally obtained by Rui Pinto. UEFA's investigators asked for more emails and documents to help them evaluate the six they had, but this was blocked by City. This program has seen material examined by UEFA and their analysis of the six City emails. The first was apparently sent in April 2010 from Simon Pierce, Mansour's right-hand man and City board director. It went to a man acting on behalf of city sponsors. It suggested that Pierce was proposing the sponsor would only pay £9 million to the club over three years, because the other £12 million would come from alternative sources provided by His Highness. It was wording that immediately raised a red flag with UEFA. 
In his defense, Pierce strongly denied any suggestion of wrongdoing. He said the alternative sources were grants made available by the Abu Dhabi Tourist Authority, and His Highness was not Sheikh Mansour, but another senior royal. City never explained who the other royal was. The next email was apparently sent to Simon Pierce, now Director Strategy for the Government's Executive Affairs Authority, from City's Chief Financial Officer, Graham Wallace. Wallace apparently sent a proposed funding schedule with it, telling Pierce, what we therefore need is that the monies we are attributing to Etislat and Etihad, as shown, are physically remitted to us by those businesses, as opposed to a combined receipt of partner equity funding, all remitted in one lump. I appreciate for Mohammed that this is slightly more complicated, but it is important for us to affect this for audit purposes. UEFA had discovered that a combined lump sum of £31.7 million had been made to City by a Jabba Mohammed, a well-connected Emirati who provided financial and broking services to commercial entities in the UAE. Was this the Mohammed in the email? City refused to identify him, claiming, Mohammed is a very common name in the Middle East. And it was a long time ago. Eventually, Simon Pierce admitted to UEFA that the Mohammed in question was in fact Mohammed Rashid al Ketbi of ADUG, the Abu Dhabi United Group, a private company owned by Sheikh Mansour. Pierce said the email referred to a cash flow crisis. The third email again sent to Simon Pierce was from Andrew Widowson, now City's acting chief financial officer, and copied into Graham Wallace, now City's chief operating officer. In it, Widowson asks Pierce to ensure that 27 million pounds to be funded via Etihad, 15 million pounds to be funded via Etisalat. Totaling 42 million pounds, he asks that these funds are routed through the partners, and they then forward on to us as part of the overall fees owing. City had previously said its sponsorship deal with Etihad was worth 35 million pounds, and its deal with Etisalat was worth 16 and a half million. UEFA concluded that Etihad had actually only paid City just eight million, and Etisalat had only paid one and a half million. When asked to explain this, Pierce said Widdowson, his acting chief financial officer, was confused. He said Etihad paid eight million pounds from its marketing budget and the remainder from what he called central funds. Quite what these central funds were was never explained. The emails were important. For us, it was clear that Manchester City was cheating with its commercial income and was deflecting from the losses. The next email to City's new chief financial officer, Jorge Chumilias, who'd replaced Widdowson, was in response to his asking Pierce to explain how the additional sponsorship money could be accounted for. Pierce replies, we can't show the payment routes. So it's funding income that we should call partner funding and we should show the total and timing requirements for a receipt, but we should not include any more detail than that. UEFA believed this was clear evidence of Pierce explaining how to cover their tracks. Pierce said, Shumilias, appears to have been under a misapprehension and that his chief financial officer did not understand the source of sponsorship payments. The fifth email sent in December 2013 was another from Chumilias to Pierce. 
In it, the Spanish CFO confirmed how to structure the budget breakdown. In summary, ADUG's contribution for a total of £88.5 million, Etihad Direct's contribution for £8 million. For UEFA's investigators, the wrongdoing was crystal clear. Pierre suggested his CFO was incorrect and appears to reflect his continuing misunderstanding regarding the source of these funds. Pierce never corrected this misunderstanding. The sixth email sent two years later concerning yet another budget appeared to show the same accounting pattern. Once again, Chumilias refers to large sponsorship fees of which Etihad would pay a fraction. Please note that out of those £67.5 million, £8 million should be funded directly by Etihad and £59.5 million by ADUG. ADUG, the Abu Dhabi United Group, City's ultimate owner. Again, Pierce said his CFO, City's chief financial officer, was misunderstanding. UEFA noted the continuous misunderstanding was never corrected. After examining City's emails, bank statements and submissions for months, UEFA's chief investigator, Yves Leterme, submitted his findings to the adjudicatory chamber. The AC is a body entirely independent of UEFA and, like the investigatory chamber, made up of respected lawyers and accountants and chaired by a KC. In February 2020, the AC reached its verdict. Their assessment was never made public. Until now. We understand they wrote that City's behaviour establishes a series of very serious breaches. And the seriousness of these breaches is compounded by the failure to cooperate with the investigatory chamber. They said the club did not truthfully declare its sponsorship income. The UEFA club financial control body found uh, Manchester City to be guilty uh, of uh, lying, lying about uh, its uh, accounts. The adjudicatory chamber concluded payments reportedly made by sponsors were in reality payments from ADUG or the owner. The AC said they were comfortably satisfied that the leaked emails were true and provided compelling evidence that tens of millions of pounds were to be funded or procured to be funded by or on behalf of ADUG, so as to disguise the true purpose of equity funding. It added, the AC is comfortably satisfied that the club and ADUG entered into the arrangements set out in the emails and that these arrangements continued until at least the year 2015-16. The AC also focused on a multi-million pounds payment made by the financial fixer and broker Jabba Mohammed. The management of the club was well aware that the payments totaling 30 million pounds made by Jabba Mohammed were made as equity funding, not as payments for the sponsor on account of genuine sponsorship liabilities. The control body uh, was satisfied with the evidence provided that Manchester City and the ultimate owner were, uh, were using this scheme to finance the club. The AC was highly skeptical of City's account of the Etisilat deal, saying, the senior management of the club clearly understood that payments purportedly made on behalf of Etisilat were actually made by way of equity funding paid by or at the instigation of ADUG. And it questioned City's explanation about the company's need for extra funds. Why a corporation with revenues of more than $14 billion in 2015 needed any assistance from ADUG in making payments to the club. Looking at the Etihad sponsorship deals, the AC said the club was funded by sums originating from its original owner, which were disguised as sponsorship income from Etisilat and Etihad. Adding, the club's accounting was designed to conceal the true source of funding. The audited financial statement submitted to the FA 
overstated the club's true sponsorship revenue. They said City did not provide correct financial statements. This is a well-resourced club, which had access to the best legal and accounting practices and fully understood the regulations which it was attempting to circumvent. City, they concluded, had been obstructive and not told the truth. This case is by far the most serious breach of the regulations to have been referred to the AC. The defense that the leaked emails could result from confused language used by a finance team at a time of extreme cash flow pressure was completely unreal. It was, they said, the most serious breach, sophisticated, thoughtful and fundamental attempt to circumvent or violate the financial fair play rules. The AC's verdict was sent directly to City. Their punishment? Enormous. People are talking about nothing else. Uh, in the football world around Europe. Manchester City have been banned from the most prestigious and lucrative tournament in club football, the UEFA Champions League. They've been kicked out for two years for allegedly breaching financial rules. When the punishment was announced, it was stunning in its severity. A ban of two years will be hundreds of millions of euros in direct and indirect financial losses not to mention reputational losses, inability to sign players, status and so on. Huge, huge impact. It was arguably the biggest, most serious punishment ever handed out to a football club. It would have rocked the club to its very foundations. Manchester City's two-year ban from European football threatened not only the club's existence, but Sheikh Mansour's soft power strategy. It's clearly the ticket to the Western society, to the Western world of business, and to Western politics. Because you get the eyes of the world if you are involved on high-level football. Financial sanctions are irrelevant because they have unlimited money. They have other objectives, which may be a geopolitical struggle with neighbours or rivals. It may be a way to launder their image. It may be a way simply to promote the interests of the ruling elite in that country. Regardless of any of those objectives, they are not necessarily aligned with what is good for football. When we look at Manchester City, not only Manchester City, we look at Qatar and Paris Saint-Germain, what, what are we talking about and what do they want? It's kind of a soft power play in a way. Saying, look, we're just like you. We like football, you like football. Um, we're gonna create happy times for, for our supporters. Don't look over there, don't look at that stuff. Um, you know, um, migrant worker conditions in our countries, um, human rights, um, the LGBT element. Look at, look at, this, this shiny football thing that, you know, we like it and you like it, can't we be friends? You know, they call it sports washing, but really what it is, is image laundering. That's what it really is. It's laundering their image through sport, through buying up football clubs, etc. Lausanne, Switzerland, the headquarters of CAS, the court of arbitration for sport, sport's highest legal body. This is where City came to challenge UEFA's ban. But unlike normal courts, CAS's proceedings are held in secret. So secret that those who worked for it want to stay in the shadows. It's unnecessarily secretive in the way it operates and organisationally, and there's no need for it. It's not accountable enough. And when something is not accountable enough or transparent enough, there are problems, both actual and perceived. Well, why is it so secretive? I don't know. You have to ask them. What I can tell you is that it ought not to be so secretive. I believe that the problems those institutions have is that there are no adequate rules of governance and that there are conflicts of interest. It was unexpected and surprising to many, given the gravity of the charges against City 
that just two weeks before the showdown at Cass, UEFA's president Alexander Cheferin was seen in City's director's box alongside City Club chairman Haldun Al Mubarak. City's legal position looked impossible. But determined to win, they recruited an elite legal squad of 12, including two KCs. Flown in, it was said, on an Etihad jet. This really was never going to be an equal fight. And UEFA, for all its riches, is a football organization. Really, it's taking a catapult to a war with someone who's armed with a tank. Manchester City's tone was, it doesn't matter how much we need to spend, we'll chuck as much money as we need on lawyers, and if we have to keep people, you know, at bay with lawyers spending millions and millions of pounds, then so be it, that's what we'll do. UEFA's team of six and City's team of 12 would be judged by three CAS arbitrators. A French lawyer, Andrew de Lotbinier, McDougall KC, Ulrich Haas, a Swiss law professor and veteran CAS arbitrator, and Rui Botica Santos, a Portuguese lawyer licensed in Brazil, Macau, and East Timor, the panel president. CAS's secretary general for the past 20 years, Mathieu Reeb, also sat in. The arbitrators heard UEFA describe how City obstructed their original investigation by failing to produce requested documents, failing to present witnesses when asked, failing to answer questions. Over three days, Cass's arbitrators forensically examined the six football leaks emails. Simon Pierce, speaking remotely from Australia, said they'd been wrongly interpreted leading to some confusion among individuals at the club over the source of sponsorship payments. Previously, he'd suggested his CFO was incorrect and appears to reflect his continuing misunderstanding regarding the source of these funds. He doesn't understand the sponsor's payment mechanism. UEFA's expert witness, forensic accountant Noel Lindsay, also speaking remotely, was asked, if he was satisfied he'd seen enough evidence from City to clarify the payment routes and mechanisms, he replied, No, I'm not satisfied with what I've been shown, because I feel I've been shown, in essence, the tip of the iceberg. We haven't been provided with any of the contemporaneous email traffic and other documents that put these transactions into context. He said he'd not been given access to Eddie Had or Eddie Salat's books, something UEFA surprisingly chose not to pursue given City's legal requirements to assist fully with all financial disclosure. It seemed odd that UEFA weren't full-throatedly trying to prosecute this. They didn't exercise their right to get access to all kinds of paperwork and documents and information. My initial reaction to it was, I can't believe UEFA didn't square those points off. City again argued that the email evidence fell outside UEFA's time limit. The defence that City used in the case was that a lot of this stuff was too old, it was time-barred. UEFA's investigation set a five-year period starting on March 7, 2014. City disagreed. They wanted a later date to avoid much of the material in the Football League's emails. The CAS arbitrators decided on a completely different date, which took the Etisalat deals off the table. They argued the correct cut-off date was five years back from May 2019, when UEFA first brought charges. That didn't make sense to the people who investigated the club's books because the deals, the FFP investigations or the, 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 the uh, licensing that UEFA requires of teams is done on a, a three-year rolling cycle. So the fruits of those deals were still in place at some of the times within the five-year period. To those who investigated, or according to people close to them, it was clear, slam dunk, that's the money, that's within the time period. 
The cat arbitrators retired to consider their verdict. When it came a month later, it was on a two to one majority. So the big breaking news is that Manchester City's two season European ban has been lifted. I don't think it was a good day for football yesterday. It's a disgraceful decision. This is a scandal. This is one of the, the biggest uh, scandals um, uh, on, on this level. The only reason why the evidence put forward in the case did not lead to a final conviction of Manchester City had nothing to do with the substance or uh, the credibility uh, or reliability of the, uh, of the emails. City was ordered to pay a 10 million euros fine after Cass concluded they'd shown a blatant disregard for UEFA's investigative process. To a large extent, uh, they've rewarded City uh, for its lack of cooperation and the fact that, in, that they acted in a way that made it harder for the investigation to take place and for the facts to be found. So how did Cass reach their controversial decision? The arbitrator said, there was no evidence that Pierce's claims of alternative funding from His Highness had ever been executed. Writing of the testimony given by Pierce and James Hogan, then president and CEO of Etihad Airlines, they found the majority of the panel holds that the funding was genuine by the testimony of Mr. Hogan and Mr. Pierce. It was not established he was authorized to conclude contracts. It was by no means a given that an email requesting Mr. Pierce to act in a certain way would undoubtedly be executed. On the specific charges that equity funding was disguised as sponsorship money, they concluded it would require finding that both Mr. Hogan and Mr. Pierce were lying. This is not accepted, and the panel finds that MCFC's explanation is not incredible. I'm surprised by the assessment made of the evidence. The evidence was quite strongly pointing at the existence of, of a scheme uh, to funnel money to uh, Manchester City from the ultimate owner to the club uh, without informing UEFA. The evidence presented by CAS and has assessed by the CAS panel itself seemed to me to be rather compelling and strong evidence that that violation did occur. I think I personally would have seen it differently that the people testifying on the side of Manchester City, and in particular the executives involved on the side of the companies owned by the ultimate owner of Manchester City, which allegedly made the payments through the, sponsor, um, the sponsors, decided that those testimonies were very credible and that they were more credible and um, than, you know, than the emails. I've had many doubts about CAS for a long time. Yes, it surprises me, and it doesn't surprise me. What surprises me is that this is happening in the 21st century. There were also doubts in the sports world about the selection of the arbitrators. Each side gets to choose one arbitrator, with the third appointed independently by Cass. So normally the two representatives have to, to find out with the help of uh, an institution in the Cass uh, who should become the third guy. But in this case, in the Man City case, Man City proposed this third guy who became the, um, the chairman. And um, this is ridiculous. You can't accept this. City's proposal of the chairman meant that two thirds of the panel had been proposed by the club. Now, Cass will say, well, the other side has a chance to object to that. Yes, but Cass's primary job in that instance would be to appoint an independent chair. It's rare uh, for one of the parties to say, oh, we have this person that we believe will be a good chair of the panel and for the other party to accept it. That happened in this case. Cities uh, proposed the name and 
and, and the UEFA accepted it. Uh, it's not prohibited by the rules, but it is odd. It is not common to happen. We asked CAS for their responses on secrecy. They told us the award, MCFC UEFA, has been published by CAS. The hearing could have been public, but no one requested a public hearing. The party submissions and evidence are not public, but this is no different to other arbitral tribunals or state courts. On the selection of the chairman, they said, it is correct that the chair was proposed by MCFC and UEFA by mutual agreement, but such nomination process is not extremely unusual. Another concern for some was potential conflicts of interest. We, Botica Santos, has uh, done cast arbitration in the past, um, but he's also a practicing lawyer, and a practicing lawyer in a firm in which he is uh, specialized as well in oil and gas. I haven't investigated Rui Botica Santos, but what I know is he functions in the heart of companies that have petrol and gas interests. We asked Cass for their response to the question of Mr. Rui Botica Santos's independence. They replied, the president of the Cass Appeals Arbitration Division did not find any grounds that raised doubts over Mr. Botica Santos's independence. Others questioned UEFA's motivation. I believe it's more concerning that a part of UEFA didn't want the sanctions on Manchester City for economic reasons, sponsorship, and other things that happen around football, and the cost of them not being in the competition for two years. And it's very clear which UEFA officials were involved, those who wanted to punish and those who didn't. And they are still there. There is a systemic conflict of interest at the heart of UEFA dual role as, on the one hand, regulator, and on the other hand, event organizer, Obviously, they have the interest in having clubs such as Manchester City participating because that increases uh, uh, um, the financial value of this competition. A few days after CAS delivered its verdict, Bjorn Hesset, legal research assistant of arbitrator Ulrich Haas, published this article, The Duty to Cooperate. He said his views were entirely his own, but it reinforced for many widely held doubts about CAS's decision. Hesset said the ruling was undoubtedly one of the most important cases decided in recent years, adding the findings of the CAS panel are flawed and contradictory, which arguably puts UEFA's pursuit of a financial level playing field in UEFA clubs' competitions in jeopardy. On City's refusal to hand over documents, he wrote, MCFC did not provide all information requested by UEFA of the FFP, which, in the author's opinion, should have resulted in a ban from UEFA's club competitions. He concluded Cass's decision would have serious consequences for intelligence-based sports investigations and the effort of sports organisations to establish the truth in order to protect the integrity of sport. Hassett's not alone in his criticism of sports governance. For years, this former senior UEFA official questioned the integrity of the organization he worked for. I know in some cases a certain arbitrator is appointed either as sole arbitrator or as chair of the panel, where they will be the right person to arrive at the outcome that is desired, regardless of the merits of the case. There may be at the beginning a tough sanction at the first instance, where the investigators have done a great job, that they feel they've done a great job. Then it moves to a higher level, and at CAS, because of some technicality, the tough sanction evaporates. People make calls, visits are made, lawyers exchange calls and visits, and in the end, the outcome is the desired outcome. Everybody knows this inside, but no one will say it publicly. It's a charade. Then, two days after Cass released their 93-page judgment, Der Spiegel published more Football Leaks emails. It prompted some to question whether City Board Director Simon Pearce may have lied, not only to UEFA, but to Cass. Spiegel's story 
essentially said, the evidence presented by Manchester City, Simon Pearce and um, others, contradicted what was in their emails. Essentially, what was said in Cass might not be true. Apparently sent not from his Man City address, but an Abu Dhabi government agency email, Pierce apologises to Peter Baumgartner, then Etihad's chief operating officer. As I'm sure you knew, embarrassingly, it would seem that rather than overpaying you, I've underpaid you. It looks as though Pierce set out how, under its sponsorship agreement, Etihad owed City a total of £99 million. So we should be receiving a total of £99 million, of which you will provide £8 million. So, had Pierce lied when he was asked by Cass, have you ever arranged any payment to be made to Etihad in relation to its sponsorship obligations of Manchester City? Pierce said he had absolutely categorically not ever arranged any payments to be made to Etihad in relation to its sponsorship of Manchester City. The email contradicted that. The Cass verdict document reported, and I quote, Mr Pierce did not strike the panel as being an unreliable witness and indeed upholding UEFA's allegations would necessarily require a finding that his testimony was false. And I'll just remind you of what his testimony was. His testimony was, he was asked, and I quote, have you ever arranged any payment to be made to Etihad in relation to its sponsorship obligations of Manchester City Football Club? To which Mr Pierce answered, and I quote verbatim, absolutely categorically not. That should have been an enormous alarm bell to UEFA and potentially presented a gift, an open goal, to launch an appeal to the Swiss Federal Tribunal, which has the right to review CAS cases. But they didn't. Despite it being reported, they had been advised there were grounds to do so by their lawyers. This has led to big dissatisfaction amongst people involved in the system and inside UEFA, because it's embarrassing and humiliating. Then, in April 2022, Der Spiegel released even more Football Leaks emails. These included ones UEFA's investigators had asked City for, but were never given. Collectively, it looked like they presented a much fuller picture of City's behaviour. If Cass had seen these emails, would they have reached the same decision? At the same time as UEFA were investigating City, so was the Premier League. But City went to extraordinary lengths to keep this secret, even trying to impose a blanket ban on press coverage. In February 2023, the Premier League charged City with more than 100 breaches of its financial rules. The majority of the alleged charges relate to the period 2009 to 2018. The league also alleged City haven't fully cooperated with the investigation which started in December 2018, and 30 of the charges are related to that. Unlike UEFA, the Premier League has no time limit or time bar. This means the Etisalat deals will be admissible. So too the background emails, and City cannot appeal to Cass. Manchester City do appear to be using the same playbook that they used at UEFA, try and tie it up in legal issues, obfuscate, um, stymie, drag it out for as long as possible, hope that in the end the only realistic ultimate option for the Premier League is to fine them for non-cooperation with an investigation. City's legal assault has led them to even challenge the lawyer leading the Premier League case for bias, because he supports Arsenal. The final outcome could be even more catastrophic for City if it was suggested they had acted with reckless indifference towards their accounts. Among the comments in UEFA's damning judgment was this. In disguising a sponsorship revenue, payments made or caused to be made by ADUG, the club did not provide correct financial statements to the FA. Now, on the same set of accounts, the Premier League has accused City of breaching strict rules. 
These require them to provide accurate financial information that gives a true and fair view of the club's financial position, in particular with respect to its revenue, including sponsorship revenue, its related parties and its operating costs. It also demands that club directors sign a certificate declaring the information in the accounts are complete and accurate. If found guilty, City could have their titles stripped, have points deducted, or face expulsion from the league. Yves Letem, the man who led UEFA's investigation, now says because the Premier League's charges have no time bar and because there can be no appeal to Cass, the PL has a stronger case. Based on the emails and other documents he reviewed in the UEFA investigation, he added, I am convinced that fraud has been committed by Manchester City. For their part, Pierce, ADUG, City and its sponsors have continued to strenuously deny any wrongdoing. When Sheikh Mansour bought the flagging Manchester City, they'd not won a major trophy in more than 40 years. Since the first investigation into financial breaches, City, the richest club in the world, have won 10 major honours. Four Premier Leagues, five domestic cups, and now the Champions League. Sheikh Mansour and even the UAE's current president, Mohamed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, graced the box for that match, played on the third anniversary of City's overturning of the UEFA ban. But is football's appetite and acceptance for owners with the deepest pockets beginning to change? What we don't want is football competitions which are really won by and dominated by the, the, the biggest sovereign wealth funds that happen to own the club. You get, you get, you get you know, a league of oligarchs and, um, and sovereign wealth funds you know, buying success. The UK government has now set out plans for an independent regulator. Yes, I am, I'm positive that we'll see genuine reform. Um, I'm the most optimistic I've been um, so far that we will see the creation of this independent regulatory system. But do international football's governing bodies share the same desire for reform? Sports federations are not like companies. They're not like governments or state public agencies. They're not like NGOs, private uh, non-profits. They're like absolute monarchies. UEFA, and maybe not just UEFA, these are organisations aren't fit for purpose in the 21st century in the way they're structured. The commercial imperatives are sort of clashing with its disciplinary role. To me, it seems that commercial objectives override everything else. So there's an increasing number of challenges that have led even some people, some colleagues of mine, to argue uh, that uh, um, uh, CAS should be replaced uh, uh, and should be basically should end. For many sports insiders, Football and the organisations that run it have lost all integrity. It's getting worse. This is the problem. If it was getting better, it wouldn't matter. But everybody knows the system is deteriorating. Football's reputation in the last decade, two decades, has been in the gutter. What this shows is a game that's enthralled to money. What this shows is a game that really cannot police itself. I think most people within football acknowledge that the financial fair play is effectively finished. What will come after, we, we have to see in terms of the detail. But from my perspective, I think the detail is irrelevant if you're not going to implement it.